this video, I want to discuss some of the future trends that we anticipate seeing in digital journalism in the next few years here. So let's jump right in. First of all, I want to talk about some of the different evolving financial structures that we anticipate. Since the the outset of digital media and digital journalism, uh, organizations, traditional media organizations, have struggled to figure out how to how to you know kind of monetize uh, this type of service and how to get people to pay for it and all types of things and and those financial structures and, and those financial issues continue and they continue to evolve and so we anticipate seeing a, a continued evolution of those financial structures here in the next few years in, in digital journalism um, one of the things that we expect to see is organizations moving beyond hard paywalls. What we mean by that is beyond this idea of, okay, well, you can get your first five articles. It used to be you get first ten articles for free. Now it's tripped its way down to like your first five articles for a particular, you know, news magazine or newspaper. You get the first five for free and then you have to start paying for it. But we're seeing a movement beyond that to things like what we call, would call freemium, for example. Um, you can get a certain amount of stuff for free and then, uh, and then you got to pay for some of them, you know, more detailed things or different things beyond that, but but go beyond just having a strict hard paywall. You get this many for free, and then you have to start paying, and, and and so forth. Organizations are finding different ways to to work around that kind of uh, traditional structure, as traditional as it is. That's what they started doing when when all this began. But they're finding that's not as effective anymore. There's just too much availability availability of free items, and those strict uh, hard paywalls just aren't effective anymore. People aren't willing to pay for them. So organizations are starting to find other ways to, to pull in audiences beyond the use of those hard paywalls. Uh, we're also seeing a lot more nonprofit journalism. And by that, that doesn't mean that they're organizations that don't make money. I mean, obviously, if you're going to be a professional journalist, you need to make money. And, and those organizations need to keep their lights on and, and have some place to you know live or whatever to, to, to house their organization. But we're seeing instead of organizations that are um, dependent upon advertising money, for example, or even subscription money. We're seeing a lot of news or up and coming news organizations that are working under the nonprofit model, meaning they're not strictly profit driven, but they rely more on, uh, you know, crowdsourcing, uh, just the generosity, people sending them donations and things like that. Um, even, even some more traditional for profit institutions have, uh, media organizations have gone to this sort of not what they call a nonprofit journalism route where you're, you know, just you're not uh, then beholden to advertising dollars and things like that, but you're you're you have sort of the I guess the journalistic freedom, journalistic integrity of being not associated with a particular advertiser, not having to worry about that type of thing, and you know people can may find that a little more believable, trustworthy, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they're, then you're dependent on those people to kind of support you and, and finding other ways um, for people to uh, contribute. And uh, so using those, those, again, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding types of things, but moving into that what we call nonprofit journalism. Uh, so that's part of the evolving financial structure of uh, digital media as well, and digital journalism. And then you have uh, considerations for the non-paying audience, which is... Again, these places are their business. I mean, they may be sharing news, and that may be their passion, but they have to again, keep the lights on. They have to have tech, you know, the ability to update their technology and, and the ability to, to pay people and, and have them eat and things. So um, so you have uh, to find some way to integrate this non-paying audience. And um, people are, uh, smart organizations, I think, are moving away from the strictly, you know, sending out spam emails, subscribe to us, subscribe to us, subscribe to us, or give us money or whatever. And a lot of them are doing things like um, sending out, you know, as a news organization, you may send out an email or a newsletter or something each morning that has five or six headlines and a couple sentences under each one. But they can only get to that, the full story, if they then, you know, become a partner with you or, the, you know, buy a subscription or whatever. Um, but they're finding ways to engage differently with this non-paying audience rather than, uh, in other ways uh, than just you know, hitting them overhead you know, with the with the advertising uh, function and and that's all they get. They don't get any content. They don't get anything. You know, people are finding ways to to reach out to these non-paying audiences in different ways um, to enable them to to, to um, uh, pull them in more as part of that financial structure. So you're seeing differences in the way that that media organizations are uh, approaching the financial considerations of digital journalism. I think we're going to see, obviously, continued uh, evolution in that area. 
Uh, beyond the financial, we're also seeing a lot of increased collaboration. This is another trend, another, <coughs> excuse me, exciting trend, really, in digital journalism. A lot of increased collaboration uh, across platforms, across organizations, across um, skill sets and things. So, uh, so you're going to see some increased collaboration specifically in different areas. So one of those ways is those, these, uh, uh, specialist partnerships, for example, that we're seeing, you know, lots of times journalists are collaborating with uh, communicators or with uh, digital uh, graphic designers and things like that, instead of trying to do it all themselves. And we're, they're, they're finding ways to work together, these independent people coming together within an organization to, uh, to find a way to collaborate and really capitalize on the different uh, specializations and different skill sets that those individuals bring in order to, you know, the sum is greater than the whole of the parts. So they're, they're using that synergy really to uh, create a better product through that collaboration, through those partnerships. Uh, also, open source technology is uh, has become a, a huge asset for journalists. The ability to share, you know, even just, it, it could be as simple as sharing a Google Drive or a Google document with somebody. The ability to be in two completely different parts of the world and work on a project together to share information and to say nothing of the thing, you know, like the use of satellite technology and GPS and things like that, the, the, the aid that that provides journalists through these open source technologies that are available to to everyone and or at least you know very very low cost and and the ability to collaborate across these technologies and use technology to collaborate in these ways is an enormous asset for for people working in digital journalism and digital media in general so um, we're also seeing really an integration in a cool way of public libraries um, public libraries are becoming um, not only can they train people not if beyond the traditional going to journalism school route Public libraries are engaged in training, you know, what we would call citizen journalists, and have, uh, many have taken up kind of that call to kind of aid people in knowing how to how to go about searching for information and finding information. If you're, you know, trying to to, to present information to your local community, public libraries are a great way to to find out, you know, how can I research this information? And, and so you're finding a lot of collaboration between public libraries and journalists, especially citizen journalists, but also journalist schools, journalism schools and things like that. Um, so just, um, and public libraries are oftentimes also at the center of that community. And so you, they just know what's happening in a lot of ways. So not only do you have this sense of information technology and how to find this information, but, but uh, just being the heart of the community in many ways. So you're seeing much more uh, smart journalists really are, are, are utilizing those public libraries much more and, and developing relationships with them and collaborative relationships with them. And finally, you're seeing a, a greater emphasis in diversity. Um, and this is not just about, um, you know, diversity and uh, although although having people from different backgrounds and different different you know, races and things is important in journalism to, to have things seen from a different perspective that's certainly an important thing but also as i was mentioning before just a diversity of of skill sets and a diversity of ideas and diversity of perceptions and people uh, understanding that that these types of things can be valuable to you as a as a journalist to to have that different perspective have that alternative uh, viewpoint and uh, and to work together with somebody who can provide that for you so diversity is becoming a, uh, an area of, of uh, increasing importance especially in the sense of collaboration in digital journalism we're going to see more of that in the coming years and finally the, the relationship with the audience is a huge trend and, and and will be continuing to be a future trend in digital journalism the way that the way that journalists and other uh, content providers relate to the audience and engage with the audience is going to be uh, really significant so we're going to have different um, types of news moments what we call news moments people access news at different parts of the day uh, and so that's changing it used to be you know when we now we're seeing that people um, when they when they the, First of all, you're going out to seek content first thing in the morning. Usually they say from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, and then uh, during the day, it, it, media and journalism kind of becomes more of a distraction for people as they're looking for something in the afternoon, some way that they can kind of uh, escape from what they're doing or whatever. But then in the evening, this is really where it gets interesting. In the evening, they're finding these news moments are where people really engage with what they're doing. I mean, people are, you know, sitting in bed, reading their phone or their tablet or whatever, uh, and they're and they're really engaging with that in a 
deeper way, engaging with that content and that material in a much deeper way than they would at different parts of the day. So finding a way to capitalize on these news moments, um, not only when people are going to access it, but so when should we be releasing the information and, and uh, you know, uh, when, when is that going to have the greatest impact, um, that's important to note. You also have this hyper-personalization of, of the news, right? And when we see that, uh, you know, because we have so much data out there and the ability to, to track this data, um, we know what people are looking at. We know, you know, this hyper-personalization of, of uh, you know, what specifically, no matter where you're at, I mean, Google or, or and Amazon and whoever, they know what sports team I like. They know what my last purchases were, and they're sending me news. They know what politicians I'm interested in. They're sending me news related to that just for me on my device. So you're seeing this hyper-personalization in terms of relationship with the audience as well. We also need to, to keep in mind these contextual experiences. People are accessing news and accessing media in different ways now. I mean, you think about podcasts. Podcasts are not something that people, you know, it's not like a blog where you just sit down and read it and, or a book where you just sit down and read it. I mean, we're, we're experiencing these podcasts in different audio forms, for example, um, when, we're, when we're doing dishes when we're mowing, when we're working out, when we're doing all these things, right? So <clears throat> we need to keep in mind the different contextual experiences that that audience may be uh, encountering when they're um, engaging with what we're putting out there. So so what's the best way for us to deliver that information? What's the best way for us to, to kind of contextualize that based on their experience, how they may be uh, using right now? Finally, geofragmentation. Geofragmentation meaning uh, we're becoming more, and it's almost dovetails a little bit with hyper-personalization, but, but news is becoming increasingly more uh, geographically centric, you know, geocentric in, in terms of, um, we're, we're, because again, the technology tells whoever, you know, whatever, like Google knows where you're at. Amazon knows where you're at based on where your phone's at, based on all this GPS information that we're giving them so they can tell us. Uh, I mean, your weather is probably constantly updating on your phone. Right? I used to think it was amazing that the time updated on my phone when I changed time zones, but, but now the weather updates all the time based on where I'm at without me telling it anything. right? And the news is going to do that as well. Wherever I'm at, it can deliver specific news to me, hyper-localized news, uh, which is uh, significant as well. We need to keep that in mind, that people are experiencing things where they're at, when they're at, and and for who they are. It's all very hyper-personalized and, and very much, um, you know, uh, and geo-centralized and things. So, um, so, so again, our relationship with the audience is changing in how we deliver this information and how they access it and how they experience it. So those are just a few of the future trends that we're seeing in digital journalism. Uh, if you have any questions about the content or about anything else related to digital journalism, I'd be happy to answer those questions. Just shoot me an email, uh, and I'd love to hear from you. Okay. So in the meantime, I hope you're paying attention to what's happening in digital, journal digital journalism and, and that you're on the front edge of this thing.